Welcome to Future Histories, my name is Jan Groß and today's episode is a very special episode. Not only is it the last one of the year 2020, but it also is a new Future Histories live episode. This time Mattia Paganelli invited me to hold a guest lecture at the seminar at his seminar on computational arts at the Goldsmiths College in London, which I of course happily accepted. And since the guest lecture was three hours long, I proposed a format in which I would hold a short presentation on podcasting as a form of extended research and then afterwards record an episode of Future Histories live in front of the students. I'm absolutely thrilled that Benjamin Bratton agreed to be the interviewee for this Future Histories live episode. I will introduce him at the beginning of the interview and so I will restrain myself to saying that for me Benjamin is one of the most interesting thinkers of our time. His book The Stack is rich beyond belief and his work tries to bridge a gap that absolutely needs to be worked at and that is the bridge between political theory and the techno-social realities and possibilities of our time. My warmest thanks go out to Mattia for the invitation to hold the guest lecture, to Benjamin for taking part in the interview and the discussion afterwards, and to the students of the Seminar on Computational Arts for their participation. We talked quite a bit and so I split the interview into two parts, of which you will hear the first one today and the second one in two weeks' time. This will be in 2021, which leads me to wishing all of you a happy new year. Thank you for your interest in future histories, your thoughts, mails, tweets, your suggestions for guests and topics. I know 2020 has been shitty, but there are good things too, and I thank you all for that. But now enjoy today's episode of Future Histories with the great Benjamin Bratton on synthetic catalyses, platforms of platforms and red futurism. So welcome to Future Histories. My name is Jan Groß and I am very excited to welcome Benjamin Bratton as a guest in today's episode. Benjamin is Professor of Visual Arts and Director of the Center for Design and Geopolitics at the University of California, San Diego, as well as Program Director of the Terraforming Program at the Strelka Institute in Moscow. Welcome, Benjamin. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure to be here. There are multiple episodes of Future Histories that are in one way or another concerned with the topic of cybernetic plant economies in the age of their technical feasibility. You have talked and written about this topic and you introduced a term that might be helpful to understand what we are dealing with, synthetic catalexy. What are synthetic catalexies and what openings do they possibly provide? Uh, so yes, thank you for, uh, for, for the invitation to, to speak with you. I, I, the, this term synthetic catalexy comes, uh, is, is probably a good place to start. Um, on, on, the, on this, this this question of a, of a planned economy versus an unplanned economy, and maybe uh, as a way of also perhaps beginning the conversation with some consideration of what what we mean by uh, a plan, what we mean by unplanned, and maybe even what we mean by a, economy uh, in this way. So the, the term the the catalaxy originally the, the reference that I'm drawing this from is from the is in reference to. Um, the, uh, the the work of of of, of Hayek um, no, uh, and who uses this term catalexy is as a as a kind of as part of his his argument against against socialist planned economies and the sort of the mid mid twentieth century model of a of a socialist socialist planned a planned economy which we should be clear right away when we're thinking about what a planned economy might be for the mid, for the 21st century the models of a planned economy from the <clears throat> from the mid 20th century um, may not be of of may not necessarily be the, the the model reference that we should be uh that we should be building on um but suffice to say for for hayek uh, he sees markets themselves and and it should be maybe clear not necessarily uh, uh, capital, capitalism as a whole, but markets, at least in theory, 
um, as not only a space or a place by which supply and demand might meet each other, but also as a kind of calculation machine, as a kind of abs as a kind of collaborative uh, uh, a calculation machine that is both has capacities both for uh, feats of tremendous abstraction, uh, but also for um, the sort of direct fulfillment of, of, of supply and demand in, a sim in, the sim in the simplest sense. But the catalyst then one of the, it refers to this capacity of, of markets to be pricing mechanisms, that markets find prices, that the, the, how much the bananas should cost or how many, um, uh, how many desks and chairs should be produced um, is in essence calculated itself through the dynamics of the, the dynamics of the market. And so it's an understanding of the market as a kind of, not just something about which computation might be interested or something about which computation might be used to organize, but that the market itself is, has computational capacities, that it is a kind of co computational apparatus. Now, as I'm sure you are quite aware because of all of the other, the, the, the discussions that you've kind of had, he's proposing this in, in contradistinction to the classical uh, socialist pricing problem, which argues that no planned economy can possibly provide that calculative, that calculative function that a market does as quickly uh, or as efficiently uh, as the market can itself. Um, and you might imagine it, you know, sort of like if you were have 10 people sitting in a room and they want to have a conversation with each other and negotiate, negotiate something like where's, how should we rearrange the furniture in this room? And in order for the furniture in the room to be re re reorganized, every all of those ten people would have to let's say write write down their interest on a piece of paper and then send it to the office across the street, and then the office across the street will get all of these pieces of paper and then send pieces of paper back to every one of these ten people one by one. And you imagine what this conversation would be like if every time anybody needed to say anything, you have to send your what you wanted to say across the street to an office who then makes this plan and then sends it back to you. You would say, well, it'd be just simpler if we just, you just let, we had the conversation ourselves. So in any event, I, I, I'm not an Austrian, this, this isn't my necessary approach, but just, just to give a sense of what the, what, where the, what, what the idea comes from. Now, now one of the, the points that was made, and I'm sure you've raised this in some of your other podcasts, um, even back in the, you know, in the, in the sixties and seventies was that, well, fine, but, um, calc co uh, the capacity for computation, and particular networked computation, artificial computation, not the nat let's say the natural computation of the market, but the artificial computation that we're th when we think of computers and computer networks, as, you know, silicon-based computation, to send and receive information from one point to another point, um, they already sort of understood that this was. In increasingly fast in the, uh, in the, by the, again, you know, sort of in the height of the Cold War, 60s and 60s and 70s here, and the capacity for calcul of, of synthetic calculation through silicon-based computation was also increase becoming increasingly fast. And so this argument, and then even the metaphor that I'm using of the piece of paper walking across the street and stuff, this kind of bureaucratic model of, uh, or this, this particular kind of bureaucratic model of a, a planned economy was probably out of date to a great extent, and that and that it might and that the scenario people would ask is like, okay, but what if you could? What if those messages that of interest that everyone had in that rearrangement of the furniture could be said essentially instantaneously across the street? That it could be mapped against uh, a thousand different ideal models of of furniture rearrangement. Uh, and then instantaneously sent back, would not this allow for actually an acceleration in the capacity for that conversation and that negotiation to take place uh, in, in such a way that this would work? But in, in, in that not only could, compu it, should, should, should artificial computation operate to produce uh, things like pricing signals uh, and, and structure models that was equally fast to the, the kind of emergent processes of the market, but perhaps even faster, uh, and perhaps could be could draw upon 
models and again best practices and other kinds of things and goals and larger sort of sort of macro uh, uh, macro programs that would not be available to the to just the small group of people doing this nego- doing this negotiation. And so this became, as as you've all been discussing, the basis of sort of the first wave of of, of an interest in a kind of socialist cybernetics uh, economics that that ended up, you know, animated the work of, uh, you know, people like to refer to Stafford Beer, but also, uh, uh, you know, even you know, and, and, and others, in, in a certain sense, even across the political spectrum, but certainly gave the rise to a kind of uh, uh, a, a different kind of idea of what, of the mixture between computation, socialism, uh, and 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 the and the planned planned economy uh, here as well. So the term synthetic catalaxy that I re- use that I I, I mentioned this in the book the stack going now back to your now back to your original question would is a term that would refer to that process by which the 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 natural capacity for a market to Find price signals, for example, or to organize the 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 and negotiate the, to organize the relations between its negotiated participants. Um, could produce this kind of what 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 the Austrian school and 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 its descendants like to think of as a kind of spontaneous order. Could produce this process of a spontaneous order um, at a great distance and could do so at a scale. Uh, that, that by using very large scale computational systems, planetary scale computational systems, that that spontaneous order could be produced um, at a scale that would, would that would be otherwise impossible to do um, just through kind of fa- ju- just through the incremental or aggregation of of lots and lots of different uh, 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 supply and demand signals um, could do so with a speed that would be impossible. Otherwise, and in principle, could do so with the capacity for reflexive collective reason, uh, and long uh, that would be impossible otherwise, and would be able to do so with some degree of recursive piloting or or planning or a kind of the uh, and this is where the cybernetic comes in the kind of piloting function of the whole dynamic in ways that would be impossible to happen just just sponta- just spontaneously. Now, as as you you are all probably aware, Hayek was sort of poo pooed this whole idea, and indeed, um, it was you know some of the the Chicago Chicago school um, boys who were who were uh, uh, enthusiastic about the the, uh, the 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 coup in Chile in 1973 that moved uh, Allende and Stafford Beer's CyberSign project um, out of the way. Um, who later ended up becoming um, uh, qu- quite interested in the idea of, of this of the capacity for computational systems to, to have these kinds of recursive market effects, and so the last point I'll make before we move on from this with this synthetic catalyst and, the, and also to maybe introduce maybe frame part of our discussion around the planned economy in relationship to socialism and capitalism per se, is that uh, perhaps one of the historical ironies of all of this is that. Uh, we do have planned economies today. We we do have large scale um, uh, uh, s- we, synthetic catalaxy at, in the scale that I'm describing. Um, in that, this is how Walmart works. This is how Amazon works. This is how many of this is how a- Google works in terms of its pricing of of words and semantics and page views and the rest of this as well. Is that many of the large capitalist platforms that increasingly in a de facto basis take on have taken on many of the roles that had previously been assigned to uh, uh, to, assigned to, to, to states um, themselves are in in ways that would absolutely be recognized as such in the in, in high X era of the 60s and 70s planned economies uh, and they work, because they are planned economy, they work because they are able that they are able to calculate prices by integrating signals uh, with a speed and scale, uh, a, a speed and scale and complexity that would be impossible to do other possible to do otherwise, um, which allows them to do long term planning, long term kind of recursive. 
uh, 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 you know, investment in, in infrastructural investment and so forth and so on, all the things that the socialist cybernet cyberneticians were, were interested in, uh, in ways that they too would recognize as basically, yes, that's what we meant. Uh, and this, again, is kind of the irony that, that you, may, you may kind of imagine plucking some of the socialist cybernetician economists from the mid-60s and, and explaining to them how Amazon works. Um, this very, very large scale global network that doesn't actually produce anything, but maxima, but, but, but matches buyers and sellers and is this m massive logistical enterprise and, but whose real function with, as a social economy is the production of a, pr is the calculation and comp the computational calculation of a price. And then the logistical mechanism for the deliverance of, and they say, yes, 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 that's exactly what we mean. Uh, and this this is also then I think part of where maybe the interest discussion is that some of the more conventional Cold War left right distinctions of what is planned, what's not planned, what's centralized, what's decentralized, don't line up real well when we uh, when we actually sort of investigate uh, investigate th these processes that we're talking about as technical systems and as and as in as institutional systems. Uh, so in any event, that's my. That's my long answer to your simple question about what is synthetic catalexy. That means we do indeed have synthetic catalexies, even though the, these are up until today capitalist ones. I am very much interested in the possibilities of synthetic catalexies to come. Uh -huh. And I would like to build a bridge actually between a proposal by one of my other guests, Daniel E. Seros, and your analysis analysis of what you have called platform of platforms and you actually described uh, amazon as such a platform already yeah i think what dan saros describes in his book information technology and socialist construction indeed is a different kind of proposal for a platform of platforms and i think it, it uh, and i think it absolutely confirms an, an intuition you have articulated in the stack about how governance namely planning and programming, and I quote here, may be situated at, if not originate from the interface layer. There's a lot to unpack here. Let's do this step by step and start with a definition of platforms. What are platforms and what could a platform of platforms that is different from those that we already have look like? Well, it could look like, any, it could look lots of things. I, I, the platform, as I model it in the, in the stack and, and discuss it in the stack, I, I don't mean it in, in a way to sort of evangelize platforms or to argue that platforms are in themselves good or bad or whatever, but rather to try to, be, to, try to make the argument on behalf of, uh, you know, for a, a kind of futural political science or economics or, or indeed international relations or computer science and, 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 and most likely the way in which those those approaches would need to uh, kind of converge and understand each other a, a, a bit more, uh, particularly the computer science and, and political science, um, that to understand platforms not just as a kind of technical arrangement, but as an institutional form as well, uh, and one that has logics that are different than states, that are different than markets, um, that, their, that their political structure is different, and indeed their economic structure is different. So whereas... Um, a platform, in the simplest sense, can be understood as a kind of a set of generic, a kind of a set of generic schematic arrangements that allows for the organization of of other forms of of conditional participation within that schema to interoperate with one another in ways that wouldn't have been possible without their participation in that in, within that platform. And so, the platform in, in this way has this capacity to as a kind of translation mechanism, a capacity as a kind of scaffolding system by which different kinds of actions and actors and participants can, org can, can organize in relationship to one another. There's lots of technical definitions of, of platforms. My, one of my PhD students, Stephanie Sherman, is currently writing a book on the, the kind of early uh, history of platforms in the industrial era with an emphasis on, on Fordism. Um, so it's also, I think, important to say just for your listeners that when we're talking about platforms, we're not just talking about things like Airbnb and Uber and these, these, and these contemporary versions of platforms that, that, for example, Nick Cernczyk writes about in Platform Capitalism, where um, Nick, Nick is focusing on, on sort of the, the, the sort of contemporary face of many of these platforms. We can also think of platforms, you know, going back to the beginning of the urban grid as a kind of platform. 
Um, you know, some would argue even the tetrahedral body plan is a kind of platform. But the platform as a kind of as an organizational and technical logic is 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 has a has a historical scope that is that is that precedes computation and precedes planetary scale computation. Now, um, but it's one in which that that the planetary scale computations we define it never would have happened if it was not organized through pla as we understand it never would have happened if it wasn't organized through platforms. So we can talk about things like the search engine as a kind of platform in that a search engine doesn't make any of the content that's on the internet. It simply, it organizes the content that's, that other people put on the internet in such a way that in theory, it makes that content more valuable, both for the producer and the receiver of that content. So, you know, I, you, put your, you put your website or your photos or whatever on the platform, it now allows there's now thousands or if not millions of people who will see your see this information which in a way somehow makes it more, that now these that those items are more valuable for you because you've placed them on the platform they're more valuable for the receiver's place on the platform and so this is all obviously in theory but the 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 key here's that key idea around the economic difference and where they differentiate with from states and markets if if the funk, if states reproduce themselves are able to in essence pay for their provision of public services primarily through taxation, that they identify they identify kind of choke points within value chains such as a port, you know, or 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 in, you know where th goods are coming in and out or something, and they identify these kinds of of choke points within value chains and then extract some kind of not extract or, or you know they 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 absorb some of the of the value from these choke points in the form of taxation, which then pays for the long-term provision of the public services that made the production of that value possible in the first place and so on and so forth. But it's through taxation in essence that they reproduce themselves. Whereas corporations in the in the class in the sort of the normal way of, of understanding them as capitalist structures reproduce themselves through com through commodities and transactions that you produce a commodity, you pay, charge more for the commodity, and this, and this difference in this surplus between the two in the form of profit constitutes the ability for the corporation to reproduce itself. Platforms don't work either way. They don't, they don't tax you and they don't charge you. So how do they work? They work, they work fundamentally through the rationalization of the information that populates the platform in such a way that that information becomes more valuable for the users of the platform. They, it rationalizes the information that populates the platform such that that, that information becomes more valuable for the users of the platform. And that differential be between, let's say, the value of the information before it's concluded and after it's included in the platform is the basis of their, is the basis of, of how they reproduce themselves. Currently, many of those are then dependent upon uh, that that uh, sort of a secondary dependence market upon advertising, but I, I would argue that that's actually that's sort of a contingent arrangement that you we, you can have and indeed have had lots of platforms that are that are that produce that act are are that in essence reproduce themselves from, from many other kind many other kinds of ways uh, besides that. So first of all, just as a sort of a, a, a definitional basis of platforms for a, a, from the basis of our. Um, for the basis of our, our, our basis of our discussion, um, so a platform of platforms, as you've asked me, sort of here as well, would refer to some other kind of meta infrastructural mechanism that allows for multiple platforms to interoperate with each other. And so you think of it, you can think of it a bit as a kind of there's a kind of first order platforms that are structuring and scaffolding structural systems that allow for the rationalization of information that. That, that in, that's included in them. And then you can imagine sort of an aggregation of multiple platforms that in essence allows the platforms themselves to interoperate, interoperate with one another uh, in such a way as that they have this, that you, in principle that you have an even more, uh, uh, that you have other kinds of uh, 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 deliberate or, or emergent effects um, situated, situated in one way or another. Now, to the question about uh, the interface layer that you asked about where the politics sits within what's in this. I mean, I, I think in many ways, the politics of the platforms can situated in many different places and all the different points of description that I've argued here are all places that are ones that are interesting because they mediate 
power in some kind of way, that they are relevant, platforms are relevant as social technologies because they organize power in some way. I, 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 to me, this isn't a reason for to exclude them, but rather to, in essence, to be, you know, to try to, to be interested in them and to try to understand how they, how they can function as means for collective reason and societal self-composition. And to be quite concerned about the ways in which they uh, are, are, are not living up to that assignment uh, to today, because we we should expect that of them, and that and because they may not be doing so today, is it's possible to criticize them for this fact, because indeed this is something that should be expected of them. Um, the question of the interface layer, so the interface layer, as I define it, has to do really with the interface layer is the is the structure is the sort of the semiotic layer within the system that allows for the translation between users that are. Um, the users that are participating in, in in the larger system and that system itself. So, you you it, in the simplest sense, you know, you're using your computer. You're seeing all the buttons with words on them on the screen. Of all of the possible things you could do with your computer, of all the possible things your computer could do now that it's connected to the internet, all of those those trillions and trillions and trillions of possibilities are reduced to a composable array of several dozen several dozen menu items. Um, that you can you can sort of choose between that f map reduction of all of those possibilities into this composable array of menu functions is is unavoidably ideological is an unavoidably political if you want to think of it in those terms constriction or collapse of the space of possibilities into a in, into a range of options. I would also argue, though, in a certain sense, that this this is to a certain sense unavoidable as well. In that, it has when I call it a map reduction. This is exactly what it is. It's a kind in, in the same way in which you don't want a map of your city that is is one to one with your city. You don't want a map of the city that includes absolutely everything in your city on it, and the, and and would be in, in essence the most accurate map possible of of your city. You want a map that only includes that that gets rid of ninety nine percent of everything that's there, that only shows you that one percent that might be the most relevant for the purposes of, of abstract the abstractions of na of navigation. Interface layer functions in a similar way. It's a kind of reductive abstraction of the space of the vectors of navigation through the space, and because of this function of simplification, it also allows for the network effects of, uh, you know, the millions of people for whom this map is legible to actually use the system, to participate in the system, to generate value for the system, to have gener value generated for them from the system because of its, because of its simplification and, and, and its uh, arrangement in the same way in which a simple map makes the city navigable for more people um, this has, to, on the one hand, you can see this as having a kind of democratizing effect, uh, in it, but it's all, and that's, there's a political valence of that. There's a political valence in the map reduction problem itself and the ideological constraint. There's also a political function of this in, in that in the network's effects of participation, something like a kind of uh, uh, something, you, you have the kinds of aggregations of, 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 of user participants in such a way uh, that they themselves uh, enter into social relations that they wouldn't have been able to do so, wouldn't be able to do so otherwise. So uh, we're, we're still kind of setting the groundwork, I think, for maybe the the meat of our discussion. But just if if those if that's helpful in terms of kind of the the definitional terms for how uh, how from a you know from a both from a not just a computer science perspective, but indeed from a sociological theory or economics or political science perspective. How it is that we can understand the terms of these interrelations, and what what is specific about platforms, what is what is generic about platforms, in terms of how they functions in these ways, then perhaps um, perhaps that's helpful. Yes, absolutely. This is super helpful, I guess, and it's super important that we get to understand this in a different form. Yeah. And uh, you have already touched oh, upon a, how. I'm sorry. You had your question was about what other kinds of platforms could happen. Yeah. So what, the reason I asked the reason I asked I answered in this way is that defining platforms in this. I, I first would say the platforms. In general, there's lots of kinds of platforms that only could happen. I want to point your li <clears throat> listeners' attention also historically. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> to look at all of the kind of histories of platforms that in fact have preceded us uh, and, and to understand some of the, the, the structures there. So I'm sorry, please go ahead. No, I just wanted to say that you we already touched upon how the, this idea of platform of platforms um, might be able uh, to address what has been called the socialist calculation uh, problem or the, the socialist pricing problem, you you call it. And um, but in your texts, you also point that it might be able to solve the capitalist pricing problem. And maybe right. let's just point out uh, what that is and how platform of pla a platform of platforms might be able to address this one. Sure. Uh, yeah, and there's and, and there's lots of other pricing problems as well, um, besides just those just those those two. And in some respects, I think we may <clears throat> we may want to um, we may you know going forward, I think we'll probably want to open up the space of possibilities uh, beyond that that that's this sort of simple Cold War dy dynamic of that as well. But um, Yeah, to your point, I, I I argue in the book that the, in many ways it's the capitalist pricing, it, the capitalist pricing problem, as I call it, that it maybe is more uh, the more pressing issue now. So if, if through whatever bending arcs of historical irony, uh, it ended up being Walmart and Amazon that proved that this that Hayek was wrong, uh, and that the socialist cyberneticians were right, uh, and that these big capitalist companies um, solved the socialist pricing problem. Uh, in whatever strange way, um, this the capitalist pricing problem, as I define it, um, really has to do in terms of is a way of thinking about uh, pricing systems in relationship to uh, negative externalities. Uh, and, and in a larger sense, I see this I see this as part of the question of, of, of the more important question of ultimately what is planetary scale computation for. Uh, not if if the stack was a was a book that was about what is planetary scale computation and how does it work, the next book is really more answer, trying to sort of speak to this question again. What what is planetary scale computation for? How do we would see it in longer historical terms and maybe even in you know in geologic terms and sort of Anthropocene scale kinds of terms? What does it mean now that it's possible for human societies And indeed, human societies to calculate their own, to model and calculate their own processes with such speed and clarity, but also in many ways how it's possible for, if you think of the entire apparatus itself, of the satellite systems, the, the transoceanic cables, the data centers, this entire planet, this entire kind of artificial crust that we have produced around the surface of the planet, what it means for also to great for a planet to be able to model itself and act back upon itself um, with, with such, with such uh, 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 sophistication. Um, how do we understand this even in geological terms, in terms of the arc and history of, of the planet? And so there's, there's some, a lot of investment. There's some questioning then of how to locate <clears throat> the question of planetary scale computation <clears throat> within some of the philosophical questionings after planetarity uh, itself and, and, and how this would function. Now, To the question of the capitalist pricing problem, back to this, the, the capitalist pricing problem, is, as I define it, and in, 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 again, it's, it's rather schematic, has to do with the negative externalities within, within economic transactions. Um, and, and in this, trying to locate the, questions of, the question of economics, the ontology of economics within, uh, within that of ecology more broadly. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so the question of, of, of economic, the ontology of economics, that is, what is value? What is valuable? Uh, and how does and how can something be identified as valuable in, 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 what, in what, whatever whatever sense is in theory represented within the price that if there is in theory 10 euros of value within this item that the price of this will be 10 euros and that the price and that the capacity for calculation the markets to calculate this or a central computer to calculate this that there is some either correspondence between the price and the underlying value or, or distortion of correspondence between the price uh, and, the under, and, and the underlying value. And so for, the, for Hayek, there was a dis the, the, the socialist pricing realm represented a distortion of value uh, in that it could never really know uh, whether something was overpriced or underpriced because it couldn't calculate it fast enough. 
what, 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 what many of those, it's not my idea, but many of those working in fields of ecological economics have identified is that, is that there's a different kind of distortion that's happening within the market price um, in that there are underlying social and ecological costs uh, to the production and transaction and consumption of commodities that are not reflected in the price. These are called negative externalities. They would include, so if, if that $100 barrel of oil, if it costs $100 because uh, there's, you know, the, the amount of, of that's available on the world market at any, at any point in time would suggest that that's the, suggest this is the, 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 the price of it. What, what that price signal does not include, for example, are the, are the immediate and or long-term costs of burning that oil, of, of, of releasing that, of liberating that carbon into the atmosphere and the, uh, the costs of its ramifications, whether those are immediate health costs or long-term uh, uh, subtraction costs. We were having a lot of discussions of late with colleagues around negative emissions technologies and the, the need for the, not only the, 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 the decarbonization, the, 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 the not putting more carbon into the atmosphere, but the subtraction of existing carbon from the atmosphere in order to keep it two degrees, two degrees Celsius. The real question of this is how do you pay for it? Well, part of the reason you can't pay for it is because the cost of the production of that carbon in the first place was not reflected in the price signal of the of, of, of the price signal of the oil that produced that carbon in, 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 in its first instance, as, as, as you see. And so this represents a distortion of the price signal. The question then for going to this question of what, what planetary scale computation is for is to ask the question is, would it be possible to undistort this signal? Would it be possible for there to would it be possible for there to be a price signal that was in essence not distorted in this way? It would have to be a price signal where, for example, the price of that barrel of oil would somehow be able to count, be, be inclusive of not of not just the the transactional value, but ultimately all of the secondary and tertiary costs and value that would be associated with that associated with that item. Uh, such that it would be the cost of the barrel of mine being five hundred dollars a barrel or fifteen hundred dollars a barrel, if if that's what it would cost to actually, to actually deal with this. Now, what I sort of hypothesize in the book a bit as a more of as a thought experiment than than as a policy recommendation, is to ask then what you would need then is some ability for some kind of of uh, economics uh, calculative substrate that was able not just to identify the immediate transactional relations, but to hypothesize a futural value of that, of, of that to imagine in the future what the cost of that would, would, would be that has not happened yet, right? So you burn the barrel of oil in the future, there will be these costs that are associated with it in the form of negative externalities. But how much is that? for one barrel of oil or for 10 barrels of oil or for one bicycle or for one lunch or for w one whatever. There would be a future cost that hasn't happened yet. There would have to be a way in essence to price the future. And how would you calculate the pricing of the future into the transaction in some, ki in some kind of way? So this sort of led us to some of the questions about, about the ways in which planetary scale computation has has already been used as a method for futural modeling and the production of models of the future that can or should have some recursive capacity to govern the present. And that's really what I think this question of the capitalist pricing, uh, the direction of the, the de-distortion of the capitalist pricing comes down to, how can models of the, how can objective empirical, statistically valid models of the future govern the present in some kind of way? So that includes, you know, there's a lot of other discussions about just the general capacities of prospection of 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 how it is that sort of that that the prediction that the predictive structures of the future as part of human cognition play into this, the ways in which the the kind of preemptive logics of the biopolitics of planetary scale computation play into this. But we were looking at more at, at basically two things. One was climate science, and and one of the I think the key points. For this is that is that I make the argument that climate change itself, not 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 the physical geophysical fact of climate change, but the concept of climate change, 
uh, the statistical regularity that the Earth is warming is itself an epistemological accomplishment of planetary scale computation. That without this sensing, calculation, simulation, modeling apparatus of planetary scale computation, the very idea of climate change as a as a kind of as a kind of reductive statistical regularity um, of a hockey stick arc of all of the things that are going on in the planet could not be possible. And one of the things it would be possible to calculate. This is a better example of what planetary scale computation is for, uh, if you ask me, uh, and a different kind of model of its, of, its, uh, of its ultimate social, technical, and ecological potential. Um, but it's also one that is based on this, on, uh, of a kind of, of, a, of a temporal and historical differential between the past and the future. That it's used not only to mark a present moment, but also to sample moments in the past through ice core sampling or other kinds of things to, to try to understand the, the, the statistic, the, the kind of the calculus, the statistical differential arc of this over a long period of time, and also to produce valid computational simulations of what the next 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or 40 years are being like. And so when we look at all the IPCC scenarios and they're forking into the future, depending on what happens, these are computational simulations dependent upon initial, you know, different, different, different presumptions and, and, and first principles. But they are models of the future that we can and should be using to govern the present. That's what cl the climate science is kind of for. Now, and so this is one example by which, yes, we do have, we, we can imagine ways in which we have models of the future that we, we wish to have recursively come back and model the, model the present. Um, the other one, a bit more prosaic, that we've been we experimenting with is, is, around is around, of all things, insurance. Um, insurance is another way in which we have the, 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 the future is priced, uh, and that it's priced in a way that, 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 uh, that, that uh, acts back upon, the, that changes the price signal of something we do in the present. So if, an so if you're, one of my favorite, favorite magazines of all time is the is a, is a magazine called Schadenspiegel. That's the magazine of the German reinsurance agency, and it's 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 basically like Disaster Monthly, um, but it also has some of the most amazingly um, sober uh, descriptions of the implications of climate change on large scale infrastructure that you'll be able to find anywhere, um, because they're the ones on the hook for a lot of this uh, ultimately of where this would sort of to, where this would sort of to go. And so, if you wanted to build that piece of infrastructure. Not only does it need to be insured, but the insurance company needs to get reinsurance against it. And if the reinsurance company doesn't realizes that that thing is going to be extremely vulnerable to climate irregularities, um, you can't get it insured. Or if you get it insured, the price of doing it now is going to be so much higher because that insurance policy will be so expensive that it actually changes the price signal of whether we should build that infrastructure, that the infrastructure thing in the first place. So you see where I'm going with this. That if you can actually think about how, what the long-term climatic ramifications of, of some kind of action or investment would be in the future, such that those negative externalities are not, not, not only not excluded from the price, but are, are form the basis of the model by which the price is produced in the first place, then you go some, you go some distance towards at least de-distorting de that initial price signal in such a way that uh, you, you, have a, you have a transformation to something that what we even mean by price, uh, what we mean by price in the first place, you, have a, you introduce a different temporality to economic ontology in that the, the, what constitutes value is being produced, not all, is being produced in relationship to um, f relationship to not only future value in the same way as stock price is related to future value, but also related to future costs in ways in which that are inclusive in this. Uh, and, and, and this is a bit what we, this is, a, this is a bit what we mean by that, by, we, we mean by that idea. Um, part of the question, obviously some of the open questions here is, is, you know, how total of a system is necessary for this to work? Um, is there a way in which that that you know that this does this have to be entirely some sort of massively centralized mechanism, but through which other forms of valuation can, can't escape, or or is there some kind of way, some kind of way in which um, that e that the, even the organized participation within uh, a, a a kind of a, a kind of e economics of of this sort.
that is futural in this way, that is that is inclusive of that that, that is that is inclusive of what are present externalities in some sort of way. Is there some kind of way that that uh, in, the participation in this can be incentivized uh, in a way in which that it itself becomes a kind of um, a, ki a kind of catalytic institution, uh, a kind of bottom-up institution rather rather than necessarily one that that, that requires some kind of Skynet uh, system to 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 in, to to enforce itself. And uh, you know, I, I think that's that's kind of an open question, which means that in a certain sense we're back to where we started. Is that is that if all of this started in a debate between is it possible to have you know can we only have bottom up organization of this and will it work itself out or do we need some kind of centralized top down piloting function to make all of this work properly if that's the where this argument started in the 1950s even when we're talking about how you incentivize participation within the this this the the, the situation I described uh, that question doesn't uh, doesn't necessarily uh, doesn't necess doesn't present itself as already solved. This is super interesting, and um, I, I think there's a, a different layer to it, which uh, which is quite important as well. Because actually, I think what you're kind of saying is that the the future is already priced, but it could be priced much better. <laughs> um, and yes. this uh, kind of stays within the realm of pricing the future and argues for for better models and the in the and the incorporation of uh, of externalis externality specifically into the question of pricing. But for example, there yes. are yes, uh, and but there are there there are there is a different level, and maybe this is the Homo sapiens level uh, at the end. As a different level to this, and uh, Evgeny Morozov uh, writes about it in his essay in the New Left Review on Digital Socialism, and I'd like to, to quote him here. When Austrian economists respond to today's defenders of central planning by noting that any non-capitalist system, even one rooted in the power of big data, could only beat the efficiency of the price system if it also created new behavioral modes of frameworks and frameworks of meaning, they have a point. I think this is super important and I think it's relevant for what you just said as well. And yeah. uh, at least in, in uh, two key aspects, it's uh, relevant for the question of uh, th synthetic catalexies to come, specifically if they are embedded in some form of red futurism. The first one would be, and this is implicit in Morozov's quote, that prices are not just numerical, but social, and that mm -hmm. it is therefore not enough to find a different method of quantification or weighing. So this this would kind of mean that that it's not enough to to price the future even better because there's still the question of new behavioral modes and frameworks of meaning which are kind of an obstacle and a chance i guess and the the second one is that markets are not equal to capital and um uh, that uh, capital does not necessarily need markets and that therefore the force of capital as such would need to be uh, abolished if one wanted to be serious about synthetic catalexies as red futurism. And this is a specific form, you know? Yeah. Um, so I yeah. think those are probably two questions. And, and maybe if I just, to, so I can keep them in my mind at once, maybe we ask them, I'll try to answer them one at a time. And maybe you can you can ask me the second one again after this as well. So uh, I, I would say that um, I, I don't disagree. I, we, I probably don't disagree essentially with the point that um, that simply another, another, a, a, just a different means of calculating price about the same thing would be sufficient. What I'm calling a kind of a, a, a shift in economic ontology goes to that question of what value is and what is even being priced in the first place. So it's not just when we're talking about a barrel of oil, it's not just this, this particular assemblage of molecules that is transacting owners. But it's an it's an it's understood to be a whole another set of, of of past, present, and future dynamics that one has a legal liability in its relationship to, that becomes part of the price. And I think another way in which this goes back to this question of insurance and another futural thing, part of the inter, part of the question about price again has to do with it, and another kind of externality is a political externality in that it, it is the institutions that allow, in essence, for the renunciation of liability in relationship to something. And you can just think, I mean, in the simplest possible sense, think of this in terms of, of like trash. So like you've got something in your house 
and you put it out in the garbage can and like someone comes along and takes it and says, well, you, this isn't yours anymore because you put it in the trash, right? And somehow in the act of like getting rid of it, you are renouncing, you're not only renouncing property claims over it, you're also renouncing liability claims over it as well, right? And so part of the process of the, the reason why negative externalities can even work in this way is because we have this magic rich, this magic function of, by which the renunciation of private property constitutes the renunciation of liability. So I can, I can spew all of the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere as I, once I, I want, and once it's sort of, you know, above my, the prop, you know, above the airspace property line of, of my factory, it's no longer my carbon dioxide, and therefore I'm no longer liable for this carbon dioxide. So you see, you see the point about this renunciation of, of, of liability uh, in this space as well. Now, when I'm talking about it as the shift of a kind of a, 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 a con the economic ontology it has to do some ways in which that magic function of renunciation of liability and renunciation of a, 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 a sort of embeddedness within these socio molecular relations. Um, is, is, is not something that can be so easily renounced, that is in fact part of what you're buying when you enter into the relations with that barrel of oil in the first place. So that is, that is when that's part of what I mean. So that is a bit where it says like, by, I, I probably agree with Evgeny in the sense to which it's not just a matter of finding another mechanism by which we measure the same thing. It's, it's a matter of changing what we're measuring in the first place. Uh, and but where I would say, where maybe disagree when he says something like I think your line was a measure. It's not just a matter of measuring and calculating something, but rather, be, but rather something else because these have social relations. I, I think my point is that measuring and calculating are social relations. It, is you can't is is that it's that all that what what he's saying is it can't just be these measuring things because it's social. I'm saying that is in fact what the social is. Social measuring things and calculating things and weighing things. Not only are social have social functions, they are social functions. That that they are sort of the key social functions um, as part of this whole as part of this this whole kind of dynamic as this as well. And so, it, it is for sure something that needs to go deeper into this question of how we identify the not only how we value the thing, but what the thing is in the first place. So ag agreed. Now, whether or not this constitutes a kind of behavioral change. Um, I, it would. I, I, I don't. It, it's a matter of. It's an open question, though. I think whether or not the behavioral and psychological transformation would be the cause or the effect. Um, you know, and obviously there's sort of different approaches and schools of thought to this. Um, there's, and, and this probably goes to a more deeper, you know, sort of approaches to ecological politics and indeed just you know all the kinds of dynamics in general. For those whose alliance, who, who's those sort of like way of seeing the world is one in which large-scale change happens through the accumulation of virtuous acts. That if enough people do enough virtuous acts, and those virtuous acts assemble into millions and billions and trillions of virtuous acts, then there will be an, in, an infrastructural transformation will ensue uh, through this deliberate, conscious uh, psychological, moral shift in, in paradigmatic worldview uh, that it, it through and then the accumulation of, of of virtuous acts, and then there's others, and I would be on the second side of this a bit more that would suggest that in many ways the history of technology and the history of society are not only intertwined with one another, but in many respects shifts in social systems and in cultural systems and indeed in political and economic systems usually happen as an, more as an effect of transformations within underlying technological systems. This is, in a certain sense, a base, base to superstructure kind of approach, that in, the, in transformations, not just in the means of production, but indeed in the mode of production, that you then see shifts in culture and shifts in psychology um, as a result of these. And so I, I think it, in many respects, my, my inclination would be to look at, look at ways in which uh, be, you'll get greater leverage faster by, sh by, looking, by, uh, by looking at ways in which there would be shifts in geotechnology and shifts in geoeconomics that would bring about shifts in geoculture uh, 
uh, rather than trying to bring about a spiritual transformation that would subsequently uh, that would subsequently down the line transform those geotechnologies. I, I just it's really not because of a, an aesthetic preference of this so much, but rather than just I think that the history of economics and the history of technology suggests that that's the most that's the uh, the, the 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 more likely path. But at least as far as far as I understand it, the question that he's aiming at when he's saying new behavioral modes and frameworks of meaning, it's more about what are the crucial points that are not uh, only concerned with the with these technical aspects of, uh, uh, for example, how to, to price the future any better, because these um, ideas of, of externalities and how you how you can behave you, with your property, this is ingrained in the very concept of prep property as such. So if you are not able to change this uh, idea of property as a form of behavioral mode and a framework of meaning, then you won't get to a point where where you will be uh, effective in um, in bringing people to a point of not treating it uh, as an externality. Uh, do, you, uh, do you see what I mean? I, I think yeah. there's a there's a way of approaching it from the perspective of uh, okay, we need to find a more effective pricing mechanism for these externalities, or we need to find a way to address this uh, social institution of property as such, because the property as such, as a social institution and a framework of meaning, is one of the root causes for the ways we do address the the the, the, the squ these questions on a large scale. And this is not coming from a moral perspective, but from a from a as well from a perspective of effectiveness i guess possibly i got it i agree with you everything up to the point of the phrase root cause i i, I <laughs> see it as root effect that i i, I like i don't i to, i completely agree with you that there's no I, that and that you can't that ultimately you can't have one without the other i i know i don't i don't argue with this at all that just a change that just a changing in that 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 you if there is a changing in somehow you know even at the level of, some shift in the geotechnology of pricing and organization and the ontology of property that has some kind of planetary scale legal binding structure if this doesn't in fact if, if this isn't in fact you know become part of the culture of our relationship to object and molecular assemblages around us in our socioeconomic economic if it doesn't actually become a social infrastructure and doesn't actually become a, the basis of our of, of our Of, of the way in which we plan, conceptualize, model, and recursively organize our relationship to the material world, then it, it does it's nothing. It's, it's, it's not even a it's not even a technology. It's, it, it's it, because it's not being used. There's no argument. I, I absolutely agree. And then part of the question is how is it that at, at societal levels that the kind of the kind of models that we have, Cognitive models uh, at, a, at an individual level and at a group level, cognitive models that understand and calculate, calculate advantage, calculate the future, calculate our interests, calculate our, our interactions with these kinds of things are done so in, in relationship to this, to this differential systems. If that isn't part of how we, we, we are rethinking the world. Uh, then, then these technologies are in fact not even technologies. I would, I, I would, I would, I would, I would agree with that because they're they're not being used in this way. Um, what I'm simply suggesting is that there is a presumption, and I think honestly, I think it's one that's rather deep in a in a Western liberal individualist framework. That first, there is a cognitive psychological transformation that then is man made manifest upon the world. That somehow the agency and subjectivity are the same thing. That our agency in the world is ultimately a function of our subjectivity. And what I'm suggesting, rather, I'm trying. To, I, I, honestly, I think I'm making more of a Marxian argument that that in many ways that the that the the transformations in the mode of production, and I would include these shifts in, in economic ontology as a shift in the mode of production ultimately will tra ultimately transforms the culture in its image more so you can't have one without the other but in terms of where it is that we should where i'm going to where i would place my bet now speaking of the future so sort of placing my bet on which is more a cause of the other uh, i'm going to 
I'm going to vote that base causes superstructure more than superstructure causes base. Nice, super nice. I, I, I love this answer and it uh, already touches upon um, one of the next questions, which is concerned with the individual. This has been the first part of the Future Histories Live event with Benjamin Breton. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. If you want to support Future Histories, then you can do so via Patreon or through a simple donation. And if you are not able to support Future Histories economically, then this is absolutely fine because there is a fantastic money-free way to support the project too. And that is by telling a friend about the show who might be interested in the topics we discuss here. Thank you all and hear you in two weeks.